Security. There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today is Tuesday. April 9th, 2024, kind of getting straightened out here. This is episode number 596 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. And over the next hour, 45 minutes to an hour, me, you, Toasty Pops out of Kansas City, Mr. Green Reads with his coffee cup and his so that hot, so hot right haircut now. fish, Marcus Kyler, the Yeet Crew, <laughs> Space Tacos, Kenyon Ezo. Kimberly from the couch, casually Joseph from the green room, DJ B sec in the car. Folks over on LinkedIn like Logan Fuller and Raymond Cruz. Folks over on YouTube like Ricardo Garcia, Kerry, and Ahmad Abu. We're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories. On what it means to you as a, pr a practitioner, or if you're looking to break into the industry, you're going to get massive value here because... You're going to hear about terms, concepts, and the networking is a chef's kiss. Absolutely phenomenal. Believe that. If you didn't know, I do not prepare or research for anything that's about to happen. We're 596 episodes deep into the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief podcast, and I haven't prepped once for any of them, and it's turned out okay. So we're going to keep rolling on that. Now, before I get into it, I do want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors. Start with my good friend Eric Taylor and the crew at Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses recover from cyber incidents and recover from the damage done caused by those cyber incidents. Here's the TLDR. You got a threat actor in your environment. You need them yeeted out. You call BarricadeCyber.com. They get in there. They cash them outside. How about that? Also want to say shout out and love to Anti-Siphon Training. Anti-Siphon Training is disrupting the traditional cybersecurity training industry by providing high quality, cutting edge education to everyone, regardless of financial position, which means they offer their students the opportunity to learn skills, practice what is taught, and engage with their community in a fun and inclusive way. Very similar to the way that we're kicking it here in chat today. It's all about good times. I'm a huge fan of both Barricade Cyber Solutions and Anti-Siphon Training. I consider it a great privilege and uh, an unbelievable, um, just serendipitous opportunity to be able to affiliate with them uh, and share them with you every single day on the stream. Now, every episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Brief is worth one half of a CPE. So what you do is you say what's up in chat. You grab a screenshot, right? Terry Stokes, right there. Grab a screenshot. Jim Lund, right there. Grab a screenshot. File it away. And once a year, you just count up the number of screenshots, multiply it by 0.5. And there you go. You've got the number of CPEs that you got for the year. Believe me, two and a half a week, 10 a month. You're going to get, I think most certs require you to get um, 40 a year. So you can crush that before the summer comes. And, and then you don't even have to take the CPs. You can just be like, yawn, I'm here for the good times. Hopefully you guys all enjoyed the eclipse. <laughs> we got a little bit of it here in the low country, but uh, yeah, a ask me uh, ask me at the mid-roll. We got Tidbits Tuesday coming up at the mid-roll, which means I share a little bit personal something about me. See if we jive on it. See if we resonate on it. Uh, it's all about good times there. Now, if it is your first time, your first episode, however you found us, welcome to the party, pal. We just ask that if you'd like to say hello, get the get the networking train going, get a little, get a little, uh, you know, I don't know what this is, but basically whatever this is in words, the kind of the shimmy shake I'm doing right here. Hashtag first timer in chat. If you're a first timer, drop a hashtag first timer in chat. If you're here for the beer, 
Joel Belton, here, hashtag here for the beer. And if you're a long timer, like many of you are, Cat GPT, Luke Canfield, Mr. Green Reads, Jay and Michelle, Michael Fink over on LinkedIn, so many regulars here, long timers. Hashtag Team SC. Great to have you here every single morning, kicking it, keeping it real, and uh, you know, just doing, putting the work in. But do me a favor now. Sit back, relax, and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news wash over all of us in an awesome wave. I'll see you at the mid-roll. From the CISO series, it's Cyber We got Lauren headlines. Verno today, it looks like. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. I'm Lauren Verno. Cyber attack causes major disruptions for UK vet firm. CVS, no relationship to the U.S.-based drugstore, but instead a veterinary group that operates around 500 practices worldwide, announced on the London Stock Exchange they are experiencing significant operational disruptions due to a cyber attack. Due of its ransomware. operations, 450 practices are located in the UK, which bore the brunt of the impact, while the remaining few in other countries were unaffected. CVS revealed unauthorized access was gained to some of its IT systems, which prompted a shutdown. The company says the incident has expedited the group's existing plan to transition its IT infrastructure to the cloud, a move expected to unfold over the next few weeks. All right. So a couple of things here. One, um, it's it's a you know, it's basically a large veterinary and healthcare system for lack of a better term. Now they did not use the word ransomware in this story. However, they did say there was unauthorized access to the IT systems and they're reporting that they shut it down John Taffer style, okay? Right? We've got we've got it shutting down John Taffer style here. They don't say ransomware, but here's my thing. I've been around for a hot minute. Many of you have been around here for a hot minute. If you have an unauthorized access in your environment, right? Like a, a compromise, whether it's, um, you know, a, a, an endpoint or maybe something a little bit more sinister. Um, maybe the domain controller, you might do this, but here's the deal. Like no one is shutting it down. Like you're not, again, this is a speculative hot take, but like, this is a 500 site, 10,000 employee company. You, like if you have somebody who got like, ooh, dropped creds and they logged into your environment, you're not shutting it all down. This is costing massive money every single day um, to, to, this, to this entity. So, you know, it didn't say ransomware, but it has a lot of hallmarks of ransomware. You would think that they would keep operations up and just, you know, execute incident response, bring someone in, identify where the threat actor is, quarantine those machines, eradicate, return to known good with backups or something like this. Um, they said this is going to um, accelerate their strategic plan to migrate all IT to the cloud. And it's going to take weeks. Guys, <laughs> COVID was a international global pandemic. And it, you know, people didn't snap their fingers and transition to the cloud, especially like this is a good size business, okay? I, I would call this like mid size, uh, junior large size business. It, no one's, no one's like, <laughs> there's no easy button, all right? You might think there is, but there's not. There's no script you run that Microsoft gives you, and you just double click and go get coffee, and it, it migrates your uh, infrastructure. Especially because cloud. I know there's like this um, myth that cloud is just like a, someone else's computer, and but it's not like. If you lift and shift IT on-prem infrastructure into the cloud and just stick it up there, like infrastructure as a service, you're not really getting the benefit of cloud. A cloud is more services and capabilities and platform as a service, right? So anyways, we'll see how it goes. Um, standard best practice. I just find it, I just find this right here wild. It is a publicly traded company, which makes me suspect that the lawyers are involved and they're they're um, tailoring the response going out publicly, right? 
So anyways, you know, it could be, it also could be, honestly, uh, it is European based. The patients are animals. So, you know, GDPR does not extend to animals, but obviously the animals owners, they would have the information of those individuals. And if that gets involved in a data breach, GDPR might get stink their teeth in, which this group may not be ready to uh, absorb that kind of uh, hit. So, yep, standard process. It sounds like they're doing incident response. Their reaction, their response based on the story seems to be overreacting, which is why I suspect there's something more behind it. Data privacy bill pushes forward with bipartisan support. A push for data protection emerges as two prominent U.S. legislators announced they had reached a consensus on a bipartisan data privacy bill aimed at limiting the amount of consumer data that tech companies can collect. Democratic Senator Maria Cantwell and Representative Kathy McMorris-Rogers proposed legislation that not only allows individuals to control the sale and transfer of their personal information, but also requires explicit consent for sharing sensitive data and offers the right to sue for privacy breaches. If passed, this would become the first comprehensive national law to protect consumers' data. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I love, I love that there's some like push for privacy and data regulation. Um, I got two things for you. Okay. I mean, this has got a massive 53 two bipartisan vote. Oh, this is in 2022. Uh, uh, so, okay. So a couple of things. One, um, you know, I've said it before, guys, data brokers, they are the sleepy giants. They are the um, the puppet masters behind the scene of, you know, basically our, uh, I don't want to say economy, but basically the way that things work now, data is the gold. Guys, you know, AI, I don't know if you guys have heard of this AI thing. Shall we play a game? This new AI thing. Guess what they use to train AI? Data. Guess what? The more data you got, the better the AI. Obviously, the algorithms on the on the learning models is important as well. But my point is, that's this is just yet another reason why data is so freaking valuable. So, um, comprehensive data privacy bill, love it. But I feel like they're putting a speed limit in after there's been um, like everybody's crashed their car. You know what I mean? Like the the horse is out of the barn, and you're talking about a bipartisan um, agreement on locking that barn up. We'll see. I hope, I hope they have, uh, I hope they put it in right. Uh, data brokers, there's like, it's a shadowy cabal. They have like basically access to everything. And you know, it sucks, honestly. And you know, it just is what it is. These services like meta, Facebook, Google mail, you know what I mean? I use Google mail. You don't pay for it and you like click through all the things like, do you agree to like give up your, all your data? Yes, I do. Do you agree to name your firstborn Googles? Yes, I do. Like, let me get to that application, right? So even if they do pass these uh, sweeping bills, um, the end users, the individuals whose data it is are going to be clicking right through stuff. So um, you would just hope it's the way they use the data. I bet you a, a speculative hot take if I had to have one, um, if you dig into this a little bit, you might discover that it's all about straight cash, homie. Straight cash, homie. And it's all about generating that sweet, sweet cheddar uh, for data privacy, uh, for data uh, broker companies to navigate the new regulations, right? There's probably some, I'm not talking kickbacks, but I'm just talking about, um, there's got to be money behind it, right? It just, it, the idea of like uh, righteousness and like, you know, it just, I don't feel it's applicable anymore. So anyways, speculative hot take, dig in and uh, take a look. I also want to point out really quickly, if you didn't know, there was an effort uh, maybe a year ago, there is a patchwork privacy regulation um, in the United States, right? So California has got pretty strong privacy law. Maine has got some pretty strong privacy law. Even South Carolina has got a little bit of teeth so, um, but there was a push for a national privacy uh, law at one point, like maybe last year or two years ago. It was in the last two years and it got swatted down hardcore. One of the things was that um, 
every state would have to agree to it, even if the state had a stricter privacy law. So basically like California, Maine, et cetera, would have to neuter and reduce, lower their privacy regulations to align with a federal standard. Um, so, so obviously that was ill, ill received. Um, but anyways, that's it. Department of Justice hack exposes hundreds of thousands. An attack on a consulting firm that works with the Department of Justice has exposed the data of more than 340,000 people. That's according to a data breach report filed by the consulting firm last week. Now, Greylock McKinnon Associates reported the breach occurred in May 2023, but was not discovered until February of this year. Medicare health insurance numbers, some medical information, and social security numbers were among the data accessed by the hackers. According to the record, the consulting firm says it, quote, deleted DOJ data from its systems after the incident, end quote. All right. DOJ data. 340,000 people. Not good. Department of Justice. Um, that's where <laughs> like evidence goes. Um, people, you know, uh, I don't know if uh, informants and like, you know, witnesses like John Doe one, Jane Doe one, uh, if that information would be in there where there's a mapping of like the person to the actual identity. Um so whoop, it's in Maine. See, I told you right here, Maine's privacy laws are no joke, dude. You you sneeze and accidentally say someone's name. You're like, Ugh, like Steve Carell. <laughs> like you have to notify Steve Carell that he's been <laughs> like, if you sneeze in Maine and say someone's name, you got to notify him. Like I'm being hyperbolic, but you guys get it. Um, social Socials dropped. Okay. Let's see. Uh... Let's see this company, third party risk. Someone call Neil Bridges and let him know um, that third party risk is actually a thing. Going back to the 20, June 2020 um, disagreement I had uh, <laughs> with Neil Bridges live on stream um, about third party risk. Here's the deal. I mean, it's examples like this, which is part of the reason why CMMC is coming and is supposed to raise the bar of minimum security for third party associates. Department of Justice, huge, massive federal government agency, uh, lumbering giant, didn't have a breach. Greylock McKinnon Associates had a breach. Kind of curious how big this group is. Um, oh, they got openings. Should, they're in out of Boston. Expert economic analysis and litigation support. Should we see if um they have a job for a CISO? I'm just kidding. Economist associate analyst intern. Yeah, this just looks like this is the uh the range of uh tiered jobs. I just want to point out on there, this company had this breach, they had to notify it. They're in the news, 340,000 people, and uh, all of their positions are business facing revenue generating positions you will not see any position here of information security analyst or anything like that so if i was um here's my thing usually when they say what kind of data it is in this instance it was social security numbers and more they will say if it was like employees if it was um you know uh employees of the department of justice or whatever so we don't know who it is Long story short, if we were doing bingo today, you could light up your tire fire uh, identity theft protection because 340,000 people are about to get another layer of identity theft protection from the U.S. Uh, from this uh, Greylock Wit Associates. Home Depot data leak. While Home Depot has not publicly admitted to a data breach, the register has confirmed through a statement from the company that a third-party vendor accidentally exposed certain personal details of its employees, including names, work email addresses, and user IDs during system testing. The incident was brought to light after a criminal using the name Intel Broker claimed to have posted the information on 10,000 Home Depot employees on breach forums. At this time, the breach does not appear to impact business operations or involve any customer financial data. 
All right, here we go. If uh, if Neil didn't pick up the phone, call him back because we got another one. Third party company exposed employee details, and then some uh, criminal uh, leaked it online. A couple things here. One, I love the register as a news outlet because they always use the word miscreant. Uh, scumbags is a new one. Scumbags is a new one. So uh, we'll give you we'll give you uh, we'll give you that uh, right there. Um, so here's what I think. A small sample of Home Depot employees' work email addresses and user IDs uh, were leaked when they were testing a system, okay? Then some threat actor scooped it up and published it on a dark web form. If I had to guess, the person who published it on the dark web form is either new to dark web forms or young, right? It doesn't really uh, have a lot of wicked value. Uh, I mean, there's some value, but it's just, it's like, Oh, look what I got. You know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, give me street cred. Uh, right. So that's, that's kind of what the vibe feels there. Um, the more important thing for cyber practitioners, I'm glad we finally have a story. I can, um, distill out something actually, uh, useful for y'all. This dude or whoever was testing a system and they were using, um, real data. Okay. Now, Couple things. One, when you are testing new functionality or whatever, guess what you can do? You can sanitize data. I know it takes extra time. It's a little bit longer. Oh, oh, infosec people, why are you always on my back about sanitized data? Ugh, I know what I'm doing. Ugh. Yeah, guess what? This crap happens. Had the data been sanitized, this wouldn't be a story. Also, I get that you can only test you know, kind of production in production. But if you wanted to, you could use real data. Not that you should. You should use sanitized data. You could use real data and um, set up like, you know, dedicated network pipes, like a VPN connection. I, that's a lot more work, honestly, to like have a secure network tunnel um, between the SaaS provider and you for testing purposes. For me, sanitized data, set up testing, right? Like when you do testing, what you really should be doing if you're doing it correctly is have a test plan, right? Like, oh, we're going to do this, this, and this. These are the inputs. These are expected outputs. And, you know, we're going to test on this time, date, and monitor accordingly. I don't know how long this system was publicly facing with um, data. You know, it's not like the second it went public, um, that that miscreant was standing there like, oh, I can't wait to scoop this up. Like, uh you know, like you're waiting outside uh, Target on Black Friday, circa 2012, before like Amazon, you know, changed the game. Um, so it was definitely public for a little bit. Also, when you're done testing, you've got to close out the test, right? You can't just be like, oh, it works. Let's go. Because that's another, um, that's just another one of those things. Like it's so, so vintage. Okay. It's so vintage. You see this with user access all the time too. You're going to run it. Okay. So the user access thing is like, oh, I don't have access. I don't have, hold on. I got to go full screen. Fascinating. Listen, I don't have access. I don't have access. The new hire doesn't have access. This guy just switched over here. This lady came in from corporate. She's auditing. We don't have access. Ugh! Right. And so you give them access, right? And then corporate people leave, the contract ends, whatever. And those people's access continues to persist indefinitely. And nobody is complaining like, oh, they still have access. You need to terminate that access. They still have access. Terminate the access. So it just persists indefinitely. That's a problem. That's a huge exposure. That's a risk. And that's bad practice. But because there's no squeaky wheel, because people don't do the life cycle of access, because people don't do access reviews, because people don't set accounts to automatically disable after a set amount of inactivity, some people do, you're more likely to see that than anything, you get these risks. Now, this thing right here, oh, I'm going to set it up. I'm going to test all the things. Ah, let it go. Everything tested green across the board. We're high-fiving in the back room. Everybody's celebrating. The PM is checking off every box on the chart. And then we all go out and get beers and tacos and talk about how awesome we are. Meanwhile, this system is just like, um, like a Xylon floating into the ether, just like, no problem. We're just going to continue to persist, right? 
You need to see it through to the end. The PM should have a you know, test termination workflow. There should be confirmation validation that the data is no longer accessible or the production system is no longer, uh, the uh, test system in production is no longer accessible. It's called life cycle. Most people, you know what I mean? It's, it's like most people love only the first half of the parabola. And then they're like, all right, we're at the apex. Woo. And then the back half isn't fun. So F it, let's go. Let's start up a new parabola. Let's get these projects launched, baby. Gotta, you gotta see it through, man. You gotta. You just gotta. All right. Fancy. And now a word from our sponsor, Vanta. The average security pro spends nearly a full workday every week just on compliance. With Vanta, you can automate compliance for in-demand frameworks like SOC 2, ISO 27001, and HIPAA. Even more, Vanta's market-leading trust management platform enables you to unify security program management with a built-in risk register and reporting and streamline security reviews with AI-powered security questionnaires. Over 7,000 fast-growing companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Quora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Watch Vanta's on-demand demo at vanta.com slash CISO. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash C-I-S-O. All right. Yo, let's go. Hopefully you are getting value from the stream. Welcome, party people. You're getting value, entertainment value, educational value. Do me a solid. Hit that like button on YouTube. It goes a long way to helping other people find the stream. We're at 427 of you beautiful people right now. You want to make it 428 tomorrow? Hit the like button right now and let's trigger that YouTube algorithm. Want to say thank you to all of you. Shout out to the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber, Anti-Siphon. They're straight crushing it all day, every day. Wild West Hacking Fest announcing the keynote. I know you all knew, but um, got that keynote action going. Uh, I'm very, very pleased and privileged to announce that I am one of the keynote speakers at Simply Up. Uh, at um, Wild West Hacking Fest this year. All right. Now we've got, um, we've got, hold on one second. I got to find the, uh, it's always hard because the, the baton post. Anthony, guys, listen, Simply Cyber Community Challenge. If you want to blow up your absolute feed, check it out. Go on to LinkedIn and search for the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. You can see it in blue font over a white flag down there at the bottom. Go to LinkedIn, search for that hashtag, and then connect to the people posting and connect with the people in the comments. I did it myself yesterday, made two good connections yesterday. Harish Kumar with the blue logo. Love it, love it, love it. Now, if you want the baton, and Anthony Ego Bamian, I see uh, we have somebody who's volunteered. So Anthony is gonna tag somebody if he's in chant, chat. Anthony posted yesterday, we're looking to see if Dr. Finest 809 has volunteered for the baton. So if Anthony tags Dr. Finest 809, all I would say is Dr. Finest, go on LinkedIn, share your story. Why do you, why are you a member of the Simply Cyber community? Why do you, are you into cybersecurity? Where'd you come from? Where are you going? And uh, share your story. So is Anthony in chat right now? Let's see. See, I don't know if Anthony is the Anthony that did the baton pass yesterday. Uh, we've got a volunteer, Dr. Finest. So, if, hey, I'll just let you know, if we don't see someone pick it up, I would love for Dr. Finest 809 to pick up that baton. So we'll see where that goes. All right, guys, every single day of the week is a special segment. And Tuesdays is reserved for Tidbits Tuesday, uh, where I share a little bit about myself and we see if we if we jive, if we resonate. Um, let's see, I didn't have something for today. I, I've been so, so busy, but um, let me think really quickly. 
Oh, God, I don't have anything. I'm so sorry. I guess a little bit about me. What like? I don't know. I guess I like I like sci-fi TV shows. I like action movies, and I like sci-fi TV shows. I, I just made a Battlestar Galactica reference earlier. If you haven't gone back into the uh, into the archives, dug into the crates, if you will, the Battlestar Galactica, the one from like the 2000s, pretty pretty solid sci-fi. If you're looking to go that route, also don't sleep on Carbon Carbon uh, Altered Carbon. Altered Carbon is a banger, especially season one. Season one of Altered Carbon stands on its own. Um, just a couple of my favorite sci-fi shows. I recently watched The Three Body Problem recently, so uh, it got me thinking. So anyways, if you're a sci-fi fan, holler at you. I did watch the, like one episode of the 70s version of Battlestar Galacta, and it was terrible. Oh my god, guys. You want to talk about action movies? Can we get some of this? Arguably the greatest movie of all time. Ridiculous. Actually, this is not the greatest action movie of all time. If we're gonna if we're gonna be real, the greatest action movie of all time, and I will I will fight anyone <laughs> on this. This is the greatest action movie of all time, hands down, bar none. Yes, right here. You know this. And you youngins, you uh Gen Alpha, Gen Z, or whatever gen you are, uh, if you don't know about Commando, oh, 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 oh. cancel all calls. Cancel everything and get into this. This was Apex 80s action. All right, let's get back into the news and finish strong. We've got kind of a wild card um, jaw jacking. I'm not even sure what's going to happen. Change healthcare ransom again? If you're listening to this episode, you might have missed that. I put a question mark after that title. The All right. Hey, Dr. Finest has got the baton. Anthony, thank you for tagging. Dr. Finest, we look forward to your uh, uh, post on Simply um, on LinkedIn. So reports that Change Healthcare, owned by United Health, is being extorted by a second ransomware gang while still recovering from a catastrophic attack by the Black Cat ransomware gang earlier this year. This time, Ransom Hub is claiming responsibility for the attack, reporting they've stolen four terabytes of the company's data, including medical records and payment information. The group says the healthcare group has 12 days to pay the ransom, and they only have, quote, one chance in protecting your client's data, end quote. As of this recording, Change Healthcare has not released any updates about this alleged ransom on their dedicated cyber response page. All right. So uh, in full disclosure, uh, Eric Taylor actually sent me this story last night. I didn't know it was going to be uh, today's story, obviously. So I did like comb through this one last night. So I, I do have a little bit more than um, like this. I'm, this isn't the first I'm hearing about it. So this is a little bit more of a, a, a fully baked uh, take. All right, here are my thoughts on this one. Change Healthcare gets second ransomware uh, dilemma. Now, my understanding is they haven't been hit with a second ransomware, okay? They're being threatened with a data leak, okay? So basically, another actor called Ransom Hub. So it, Ransom Hub is a new threat actor group, all right? Ransom Hub is saying they have four terabytes of data, and unless change healthcare pays them X amount of money, whatever it is, um, they're going to release it. Okay. So change healthcare already executing their IT uh, recovery plan. Second, you know, Alfie, just let's level set for a second. About a month ago, uh, Black Cat slash Alfie, this, this ransomware gang hit change healthcare really, really badly. Okay. Change healthcare was down. People couldn't get their prescriptions filled. Um, there were healthcare organizations that were unable to pay payroll. Uh, physicians and clinical care staff were working for free until they could get paid, et cetera. Some people were talking about selling their houses and stuff. Anyways, it was a hot mess express. Change Healthcare paid a $22 million ransom to basically make the, make the bad go away. Now, interestingly... Alfie basically pulled up their um, pulled up their stakes, bundled up their tent, like you know, like traveling uh, you know wanderers, uh, and 
disappeared with the $22 million. Now, I have speculated in the past that I believe this is a fat payday and the heat was on, right? You know, you've seen the movie Heat. Robert De Niro's like, got to lay low, got to lay low. Or have you seen the movie Bank Heist, uh, the, the Netflix Spanish import where they like rob and then they lay low? That's what's happening here. I suspect Alfie will resume operations under a new moniker in, you know, four to six months. Oh, wait a minute. Is this Ransom Hub a new splinter of Alfie? My, my hot take is no, it is not. Alfie is not stupid. It would be ridiculous to pull an exit scam and then try to basically pump, try to milk the same cow you just slaughtered. Like that's what's happening. Ransom Hub is trying to milk the cow that's already been taken out to the butchery and slaughtered. Here are my, here's my theory on what happened. Again, the story is Change Healthcare is being basically extorted by another threat actor. Here's what I think happened. I have a couple, I have a couple hot takes on this one, okay? Fancy. One, and this is the one I want it to be because I think it's the most, you know, juicy. I think Alfie is run by a couple like really uh, key players, right? Figureheads in the Alfie um, ransomware gang. I think the heat was on wicked bad. I think they, you know, took that $22 million and they boogied. Now there's a second tier, maybe like the loyal uh, threat actors, right? The loyal ones who have been there for a while, you know, they don't get a pension or a retirement plan. So how, how is the leadership going to take care of their underlings? Hey, you know, they probably gave them a little bit of money, but they said, hey, here's four terabytes of data. Try to squeeze them for some more money. I believe that's why Ransom Hub came, it like be, exists now. Ransom Hub, by the way, just came on the scene in February of 2024. Hmm. Seems coincidental, right? Like, so they just popped up and now they have something and they're only given change healthcare one chance. I also suspect it's because they realize that there isn't a lot of value to what they're doing. And they're just trying to make a, um, like, you know, it's like Eminem and eight mile. He's like, they're like in the back, like palms are sweaty, mom's spaghetti puked up all over them, right? They're about to go up and, you know, you know, take that one shot. So they're trying to shoot their shot. I don't think they're going to get the money. I don't know if Ransom Hub is going to, I, I almost feel like Ransom Hub is like a, uh, like a, uh, like a shell company that they're just stood up for this one thing. I, th that's my speculative hot take. I am not in the dark web. I'm not on their telegram channels. If they have those, I'm not. I'm not getting DM'd by, you know, Alfie or Ransom Hub about these things. It's just my thoughts. Uh, the other thing that could also be possible is that because Alfie has exited and there's like a vacuum, basically, that um, some, some enterprising threat actor scooped up the data. And maybe they don't even have it. Maybe they're just uh, posturing that they do. And they're just trying to get a quick payday. That could be totally there, right? Because... Alfie is technically backed out. So like Alfie's not going to show up and be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Ransom Hub is not reputable. All right, brah. So it's just, it's basically like, I almost feel like it's um like some wealthy aristocrat who got rolled by some like organized criminal thugs. And now some petty thugs are like walking by and they're like, yeah, let's, let's stick them too. Like let's rob them too. So anyways, that's my thoughts on that. I, I, I don't know if Ransom Hub will turn into a thing. I think, and I don't think it's Alf V rebranded. I think, I think it's too soon for Alf V to turn into Ransom Hub and then attack the same, the same uh, victim. I, so that's it. Bug Bounty Roundup increases to 30 million. Ooh. Crowdfence, which describes Great, themselves as a world leading research hub and acquisition platform for high quality zero day exploits and advanced vulnerability research, announced an increase in their exploit acquisition program to offer a total of 30 million in bounties. The company first announced their $10 million bug bounty program in 2019, but says they are not only upping the buying price, but also extending the scope of research to areas like enterprise software, Wi-Fi, and messengers. It's important to note, according to Security Affairs, zero-day brokers acquire zero-day exploits to resell them to intelligence and law enforcement agencies or government contractors. All right. 
$30 million exploit ex acquisition program. All right. Ooh, zero day broker announced a $30 million offer. So check this out. I want to see uh, really quickly. Yeah, $30 million. Okay, so check it out. If you've read Nicole Pellroth's book, This Is How They Tell Me The World Ends, which is an absolutely awesome book. Uh, okay, so real quick book review. Because it's all going to make sense in a hot minute. And again, I'm telling you guys, it always goes back to money. Straight cash, homie. Okay, this is the book right here. This isn't the uh, the actual book covers, uh, like dark with yellow writing. You can see it uh, right. No image available. Brosif, what are we doing here? Whatever. Anyway, this, hold on. It's important because this book is that good that it's important. Here it is. This is the, the book. If you see this book, scoop it. I'm telling you, this book is amazing. If you've read this book, let me know in chat what you think about this book. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's so good. Okay. So check it out. One of the first things that she talks about in the book is kind of the rise of the bug bounty uh, and exploit sales, uh, dark web, not dark web, but like black market, if you will. So remember, nation states, they've got money, right? And they use zero days. Zero day is basically a vulnerability that doesn't have a patch. You can have a zero day in anything, okay? Oh, there's a zero day in Exchange. Oh, there's a zero day in WordPress, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's only really valuable if you have an active exploit, right? So think about it this way. Imagine there's like a dragon, right? This is taking it back to uh, um, The Hobbit, okay? So get your Tolkien out, but this is going to make sense. Imagine you've got this big, huge, bad dragon, right? It, it's, ter it's terrorizing the land, whatever. And right under its armpit, right under its armpit is a, uh, a, a missing piece of its armor, and it's very vulnerable there. That is a zero day. It's unpatched. Dragon doesn't even know about it. The, the village people figure it out, right? The YMCA village people, right? Now, just because the dragon's got the, the, the hole in its armor, that doesn't mean anything. The dragon's still tearing, tearing the cities up, blowing fire everywhere, flying around, doing its thing. Because there's a zero day does not mean bad yet. It's only when you, when you make an exploit and, and then deploy the exploit, is it bad? And in this silly example, the exploit is an archer with an arrow strong enough to pierce the, um, the, you know, the dragon flesh underneath. So vulnerability and then exploit. Now remember, exploits, exploits, you can fire them off and they don't hit right or they don't detonate correctly or they fall flat. So think about that. That's like shooting the arrow and it, like, it hits the side of the dragon's arm or it goes into the uh, zero day hole, but it doesn't pierce the skin because it's like the wrong type of code or it's brittle, right? So hopefully this all makes sense. You can have a zero day and it's not really that bad yet until you get an exploit. And in the black market of like really, really sophisticated threat actors and nation state trained operators, that's when the exploits get very robust and very good. I'll give you a perfect example. Eternal Blue. Go Google Eternal Blue. It was an SMB exploit developed by the NSA. Some people say the CIA. I believe it's the NSA. And it was incredibly effective and incredibly robust. And it led to massive compromises internationally. Famously, WannaCry, North Korea, weaponized Eternal Blue very quickly and used it to um, deploy WannaCry all over the place. So now that we've done our little history lesson, let's go back to this story. This right here. Nation states will pay millions of dollars to get their hands on really robust exploits. And it's because if I give you, hey, if you're an operator and you're basically a lord of war and you are going to develop something that can hit a Windows server operating system, you know, 100% of the time, and I give you $2 million and I'm the only one who owns it exclusively, then I have an advantage in like a military advantage over my adversaries. Now, on top of that, 
because it's software. I can sell it to you. I can sell it to the Libyans. I can sell it to the Canadians. I can sell it to the South Africans. I can sell it to the Antarctics, right? I could sell it over and over again because it's not a manufactured product. It's it's intellectual property that can be multiplied. So all of that is to say this company is willing to offer $30 million for high-end exploits. Do you know what that means really quickly from a business perspective? Great cash, homie. If I'm going to give you, if I'm a business and I'm going to pay $30 million for an exploit or collection of exploits, how much, like, do you think I'm going to make less than $30 million on it? Hell no. Sorry, Kennedy. I'm making straight cash, homie. $30 million is an expense. Your return on investment needs to be higher than 30 million. To me, the, 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 the lead is like hidden right in the title. The market for black market, highly effective exploits is blowing up to the point of 30 million, bro. I'm sure that that is uh, maybe a larger pot and can be multiple exploits and stuff like that. But my point is, this is directly indicative of what the market is for those exploits. And you know who has more than $30 million to pay? Nation states. Private citizens aren't like, oh yeah, what like what do I get my wife for Mother's Day? Oh, what would be the perfect gift? Oh, you know what? You know what? I I think an Avanti uh you know secure connect policy exploit would be the perfect gift. I'll 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 print out the source code, I'll wrap a bow around it, I'll give her a little USB drive with a digital version. Who wouldn't love that? No. It's nation states doing nation on nation action, right? It's getting hot in here. Fancy. Hackers hijack WordPress websites. Say that three times fast. The old cryptocurrency wallet drainer scam continues. Nearly 2,000 WordPress websites have been compromised to display deceptive pop-ups for NFTs and cryptocurrency discounts, tricking users into connecting their digital wallets to platforms that siphon off their funds. Security firm Security initially found that hackers had breached around 1,000 WordPress sites to push these crypto drainers. But after not achieving their desired success, the hackers switched gears, now injecting scripts into these sites to aid in brute force attacks on the admin passwords of other websites, creating a network of about 1,700 targeted sites. Um, hackers to play crypto drainers. All right. So interesting. Couple things for you. One, um, one is um, you can have malware that's not really hurting you directly or stealing your creds, like info stealers and stuff like that. But um, just basically vampire sucking your resources, your electricity, everything like that. Remember. If I'm crypto mining on your assets, then the expense of mining isn't my expense. It's all pop profit. It's pure Great cash, homie. right. So, um, if you're running WordPress, what I would say is, um, you can see security. Security is a, um, I believe they're a website, like a web app scanning tool for vulnerabilities. If I'm not mistaken, they found 1,000 WordPress sites. Um, hold on, yeah. So actually, you know what's interesting? The WordPress sites themselves aren't hosting the miners. They've been compromised to promote, I think, advertise the um, the miners uh, with malvertising and YouTube videos. Um, let's see. They're turning web browsers into tools for brute forcing. Yeah, okay. So you can do crypto jacking in the browser. It is a technique. This would affect your end users. Um, I actually don't know off the top of my head um, the best way to uh, mitigate this. My suspicion would be you have to keep your browser up to date. The problem is, the problem is that, um, like your my aunt Donna, you know, BSEC or whatever. Like you're still able to go online. Like right now, right now, my Google Chrome instance could be crypto jacked and mining crypto, but I'm still able to navigate through websites and stuff like that. It doesn't bring you to a screeching halt. So it's not super overt. Um, obviously you will notice a performance degradation, uh, load times, uh, just overall CPU 
uh, performance and stuff like that. But, you know, unless you're like an absolute maniac like I am, um, you you wouldn't necessarily know this. This if you don't turn your computer off at night, it could be it could be mon um it could be mining all night. Again, this so there's two things here. One is your WordPress sites getting compromised and turned into basically farms to push malware to end users, and then there's end users with their web browser instances turning into crypto jacking bots. So there's two things going on here. So first thing, if you're running WordPress. Make sure that you're not compromised, right? All the things, remove plugins, make sure access is controlled, uh, keep it updated. You got to patch it. Ah, you got to patch it. If you're, you know, if you're running uh, browsers like everybody ever is, you've got to patch it. Ah, you got to patch right? it. Right? It's basically, that's it. That's all there is. Um, you know, so basically it sucks. Crypto jackers. Also, I just want to point out uh, really quickly, if you didn't hear... Charles Finfrock of this fame. I'm a crypto evangelist. I love it, love it, love it. Charles Finfrock, who's a uh, friend of Simply Cyber Community, and many of you know him already. He's got an emote in the tray. Um, he's actually coming to Charles. Uh, he's coming to the Low Country tomorrow. He's coming to where I am. He's going to be in this studio tomorrow, and he's actually going to be filming two micro courses. We've got it all lined up, and one of them is crypto for GRC people. And it's really all about, it's not about crypto, like, oh, this is how crypto works. And here's how you can get your sweet NFTs. It's more like things like this. What's crypto jacking? Things like if you have crypto on your books as a financial asset, where are you keeping them? Are you keeping them in a cold wallet, a hot wallet? Who's got access? Like it's it's really about um, you know, governance and, and uh, risk management of ha of crypto assets and crypto attacks. So it's kind of cool. It's very specific, but you all ask for um, micro courses. And, you know, I mean, it literally, maybe I need to rethink the Simply Cyber Academy because it takes me, it takes me like six to nine months to, to crank out a class. Um, let's go. New malware variant emerges. There's a new malware in town. Threat hunters have identified a new malware named Latridectus, actively involved in email phishing campaigns since late November of 2023. According to joint research by Proofpoint and Team Simru, the malware is a sophisticated downloader designed to evade detection and retrieve additional payloads for executing arbitrary commands. It's believed to be developed by the same individuals responsible for the ICE ID malware and is being used by initial access brokers to spread further malware infections. All right. Let's see. Do we have a graphic? Yeah, we got a little graphic. Hey there. Hey. Hey. What do we have? What's a, what's a, um, <laughs> All right, so Latratasis infrastructure, I'm not familiar with it, but you can see here, way to go. They have a dev server. They have a T2 server, which is a new term to me. I've heard of C2, command and control. I don't know what T as in Tom 2 is. Um, so I'd be curious about that. Uh, if anyone's got a thought or heard the term T2, let me know. But uh, you can see here, it's your classic, um, it's your classic infrastructure. This is more... It's interesting. This has the iced ID infrastructure. Iced ID was a really, uh, I guess, prolific um, piece of malware that was out there all over the place. This is what looks to me as a um, kind of post exploitation. Um, it's 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 not really a post exploitation framework, but it's this is not an initial. Um, piece them out like this is an initial infection you get infected and then they drop this thing on you uh and it handles uh persistence on your box and c2 communication so very very serious um it gets deployed through i guess it is initial infection it gets deployed through email so obviously all your standard email practices around email security gateway educating your end users edr on the agent because it will have to it will have the malware will have to detonate on the endpoint but basically what happens is um, what makes this so interesting. And if you don't know about this, uh, listen up, because this is actually how more advanced malware works. It has a uh, robust anti-evasion 
uh, anti-analysis evasion techniques, which basically means when it runs on your machine, instead of just being like, like malware, I'm doing malware things, it'll, it'll deploy, but slowly. And then it'll look and say like, Hey, is there EDR running? Yes or no. Hey, is, um, you know, it, like, is there, um, you know, like it, like, is there, am I in a sandbox? Like, is there, is there network connectivity? Am I, are there certain apps running? Like is Procmon running is, um, you know, like, uh, uh, uh what is it? A pate DNS running like it's the tools that malware analysts would use before detonating malware so they could analyze it. That's what like anti uh, analysis evasion is. It's like it's it's like looking to see all those things before detonating to make it more difficult to discover that you're running malware or to be analyzed for malware. Also, they said that the um, the C2 traffic, which is basically the data uh, sent back to the server for commands and whatnot, is encrypted. So even if you um, detect it and sniff it, you can't read it. Um, it doesn't say this, but it doesn't say this, but I would suspect that it's running over port 443, which is um, encrypted web traffic, which everybody everywhere is allowing 443 open to the internet because it's, you know, like welcome to the 2024 where cloud systems run, run amok. So you're not, you're not basically stopping 443. And if you're an analyst, you're not you're not looking at 443 traffic and being like, oh, I'm going to evaluate this, right? CYMRU is pronounced Comrie. Is that in here? Is the word Comrie in here? Team Comrie. All right. Proofpoint and Team Comrie said in a joint analysis. I've never heard of Team Comrie, Jess Bishop. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jess Bishop. Uh, wonderful uh, SOC analyst and Simply Cyber community member. Blue badge looks good on you. Uh, let's see. I like that uh, Kimberly uh, from the couch uh, taking a call right as Jaw Jackin's about to go. Convenient, Kimberly. Uh, looks like here's a, a deep write up. I will say personally, this is from Proof Points blog post, and Team Comrie is uh, part of the research team. I've used Proof Point professionally. This isn't a paid endorsement. I think Proof Point is phenomenal. Proof Point is a great. Um, is a great uh, tool. Here's a link to the blog post, okay? If you want to check it out for a little bit more. Retaining cyber talent isn't easy. An organ All right, look at us. Just crushing it like no big deal. All right, y'all, guess what? It is almost 9 a.m. It's Tuesday, which means I'm going to the Citadel to teach. And I'm not even teaching today. I have the distinguished privilege and honor to welcome a very special guest to guest lecture my class today, um, current Department of Homeland Security Chief Information Security Officer, which is super dope. Uh, I'm good friends with him, and um, you know we, we get to do this a couple times a year uh, together. So if you are uh, interested, come back tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, or excuse me, oops, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow for Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Brief. Mark your calendar because on Thursday, we're welcoming Savannah Lazara, Red Team operator, keynote speaker uh, at the Red Team Village last year. Uh, just a, an amazing practitioner. We're going to get to know her. It's a fireside chat. Bring your questions, hang out, high fives, all the standard stuff. Oh, hey, I'm just getting an update right now. A T2 server is a very elastic AWS server that can burst CPU speeds. I, I don't know why they included that. It's not really part of a, a IT infrastructure. All right, it looks like we're not going to have jaw jacking. So uh, set your expectations all. Grab your tissues. Grab your tissues. Um, we we do not have jaw jacking. DJ BSEC has some uh, personal um matters to attend to i will answer one jaw jacking question uh from gary sturgiatis blue badge and uh fellow beer lover we had the story about the exploits in the 30 million dollars right where is it 30 million dollars okay gary said if the market for exploits is increasing this much does this mean defenses are getting better initially i thought that gary but as i mulled over it um i honestly suspect 
that there's two things going on here. One, yes, defenses are getting better. But two, the market, if you think about just like a free market and economy, you know, supply and demand, people will pay, um, you know, based on uh, supply. So I think the market is dictating that, hey, like there's more people wanting zero days and exploits. We've got elevated um, military conflicts internationally, right? I mean, there's several global conflicts going on right now. Um, there's this BRICS thing that's kind of growing up. There is U.S. elections coming up in November. There's a lot of hot stuff going on. And I think this um, market movement indicates that there's just a, a richer demand uh, for that. Again, I think it, we can both be right. I think defenses are getting better for sure. But I suspect it's because the market is dictating that price point. All right. I saw a super chat come in from Toasty Pops. Kansas City's own. We just become best friends. Yep. Join me tonight at Tall Trellis Brew, 5 to 9 p.m. Oh, hey, listen, if you're in the Kansas City area, um, if you're in the Kansas City area, it looks like the Simply Cyber Kansas City local um, faction is hosting or is holding a Kansas City local meetup. You guys can all uh, Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes high five each other at Tall Trellis Brew. 5 to 9 p.m. tonight. Thank you so much, Toasty Pops. Still looking for that flag. I swear to God. It's it's somewhere. I haven't forgot. All right, guys. We tried We tried to get Kimberly Can Fix It um, to jump on jaw jacking just to, just to uh, push it a little bit, but we couldn't. That's okay. Guys, do me a favor. Have a great day. I will see you all tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. Until next time, stay secure. If you enjoyed that content, keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed